Let's play a game. I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and you can think about the answer for a bit. Let's begin. Do you believe in ghosts? Have you ever broken a bone? Okay, the last one's quite controversial, but does pineapple actually belong on pizza? Try and remember your answers, because we're going to need them in a bit. Do you remember the Black Lives Matter protests back in June of 2020, when COVID first hit and we just started lockdowns? I remember feeling so inspired and hopeful in humanity when I saw pictures and videos of masses amounts of people coming together and standing in unity all over the world. Businesses and institutes would pay their respects to George Floyd and show their support for the BLM movement through a formal email, a letter on their door, or even a social media post. I actually had a friend with a rather successful software company at that point, and he decided to put out a statement. In summary, that statement read that his company stands in solidarity with black people, that uh, we as people should reflect on how we can be better. But when I asked him about his personal opinion on the upheaval at that moment, he said, and I quote, I don't have an opinion. I choose to remain neutral on these matters. His neutrality rubbed me the wrong way, to say the very least. Remember the questions I asked you earlier? Notice how your answers were either yes or no. It was either no, I've never broken a bone, or yes, pineapple does actually belong on pizza, which it does. There really wasn't an in-between. In reality, a person can only be neutral if they're unaffected by or comfortable in the issues at hand. And the only way a person can choose neutrality is, and prioritize their comfort is when those issues actually benefit them. For example, we know today that people, often white or wealthy, are afforded better opportunities in education as well as housing security simply because of the community in which they live. But there's an important myth that I would like to bust about neutrality. In most cases, it actually doesn't exist. For example, you know when the teacher asks the class, any questions, and we all sit there in awkward silence? We have just let the teacher know that we understand the content, that we don't have any questions, and that we give them the consent to continue. Our silence wasn't neutrality. Our silence was an answer. The problem is, neutrality often has the point of view of supporting the status quo. Uh, so when my friend told me about his opinion on racism and violence, I looked at him and said, you are the problem. I had to quickly laugh it off and take it back because he was so uncomfortable that he physically cringed. But speaking about being uncomfortable, let me take you back to my first morning at a new school in a new country that was vastly different from the one in which I grew up. I was sitting alone, eagerly waiting for classes to start, until this really, really nice girl walked up to me and introduced me to a bunch of new people. Lunch rolls around, and... Lunch rolls around, and instead of sitting away, tucked away in the back of the cafeteria, I choose courage and I decide to sit with these new people. Hopefully, my new friends. Everything seemed to be going just fine until this one guy, who everyone seemed to love, started telling these jokes. These jokes were laced with racism and stereotypes that singled me out, the 14-year-old girl who looked and talked differently from everyone else. Although these jokes were small, even insignificant. But there were so many in succession, like a gun shooting over and over and over again without a pause. Remember, I wasn't there alone. There were at least five other people who chose to spectate instead of doing anything. Some of them even laughed with him, which only seemed to give that gun a little more ammunition. Those kids chose what some might call neutrality. They didn't say anything, they stayed silent, but that silence gave that jokester consent to continue. 
I was so uncomfortable in that situation that I begged for him to stop. And when I was so clearly on the brink of tears, that really nice girl turned to me and said, well, if you don't like it here, you can leave, as if I was the problem. Everywhere I turned, there was a racist remark here or a stare up and down there. Every time I look back on these experiences, I'm always told that it wasn't their fault. They were young, they were naive, they didn't know what they were talking about. It was such a long time ago. Let it go. But the thing is, I was just as young and naive as everyone else. But I happened to be old enough to bear the weights and the consequences of people's ignorance and carry that for the rest of my life. I never really got to take a break from racism. I was always exposed to this false belief that I wasn't good enough and that I needed to change. And when I was alone, those comments screamed loudly from within, telling me to lighten my skin, straighten my hair, change my accent, and just try and be more white. And although those moments were rather difficult, the way I'm choosing to process this is by articulating what can be learned from my experiences. The first thing I'd like to say is that comments about people's race are never just jokes, and that words can carry a hurt that lasts. This story happened almost four years ago now, and to this day, thinking about that boy making those jokes in that cafeteria still upsets me. The next takeaway is the true meaning of neutrality. Although it's easier to sit down, stay quiet, avoid interpersonal conflict, and stay comfortable, being neutral means taking an active position, the side of the aggressor or the status quo. Those kids chose the jokester's side. They chose to tolerate racism, and they chose to tolerate my being hurt. The next thing is to recognize your privilege. People, usually white, male, straight, European or even wealthy, often have the upper hand in society. Chances are you can use your privilege and use your voice to help others who can't help themselves. That day, my begging wasn't enough. Had one other person stepped up, even if it didn't stop that attack, I would have felt a lot less alone, and I promise that makes a huge difference. On top of that, you need to educate yourselves on systemic oppression. We have this really, really cool thing called the internet, which gives us a bunch of stuff at a click of a button. And when you boil it down, asking a person of color, for example, about racism only adds another thing on top of the burdens that they deal with every single day. Okay, the next thing is to educate young people about racism. Oftentimes, the counter-argument is that they're too young to learn about it. But the thing is, children of color should be too young to go through racism. But they do so nonetheless. By teaching young children about racism, we can avoid a lot of unnecessary hurt and conflict. The next thing is that if you are of color, I'm sorry that you have to deal with whatever you had to deal with. It's not your fault. You didn't choose to be of color. And I'm sorry that you have to bear the consequences of people's ignorance. I hope that every day, more and more, you can learn to love yourself, your color, culture, and all. So, next time you decide to be neutral and stay silent, remember that pineapple either belongs on pizza or it doesn't.